So, so, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Professor Charles Hodgkin here today. Thank you ever so much for coming, because I know this is out of turn, um, so it's difficult, obviously, and there's many people away. And so thank you ever so much for coming along today. Um, I really am delighted to invite um, Charles here, particularly at the time in which we find ourselves, because I've recently started a um, European Research Council funded project, um, past and present musical encounters across the Strait of Gibraltar. And started in April, both Vanessa and Steve are on that project. Um, where we're exploring musical encounters between North Africa and Southern Europe and the ways in which the, the heritage, the history of uh, many of Spain intersects with um, musical exchanges. Um, so really, uh, Charles' work intersects very nicely um, with the project, so it's really great to have him here. Um, so Charles Hershkin is Associate Professor of Anthropology um, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, his research interests concern religious practice, media technologies and emergent forms political community in the urban Middle East and Europe. He's published extensively on religion, politics and history in the Middle East and Europe, including two books, The Ethical Soundscape, Cassette Sermons and Islamic Encounter Publics in 2006, and Powers of the Secular Modern, Talal Assad and His Interlocutors in 2005. His forthcoming book, which I'm particularly excited about, um, A Feeding for History, Romanticism, Islam and the Tradition of Andalusism is on its way. Um, with Chicago Press, so in the next few years we'll see that, um, where he bases his research in southern Spain and explores some of the different ways in which Europe's Islamic past inhabits its present, unsettling contemporary efforts to secure Europe's Christian civilizational identity. And it's from this book that Charles's talk is derived today, where he's focusing on the relationship between flamenco um, and the rediscovery um, of Islamic Spain. So please join me in welcoming Professor Charles Thank you. So some of the history I will speak about here will be familiar to probably many of you who, who have an interest in filmmaking. So in 1924, Blas Infante, the quote, father of Andalusian nationalism, as he came to be called, set out on a journey from the city of Ahmad in Morocco. I was determined, he later reflected, to renew the wanderings of our, our fathers had made at one time to the tomb of one of the men who characterized the spirit of of our land, Abu Qasim ibn Abad al Muattamid, the true king of Sevilla, Cordoba, Malaga, and Algarve. Six centuries, and Andalusia has not sent its condolences in the living body of one of its children to the tomb of the poet king, who died in the distant desert, invoking his homeland with his pain filled verses. Infante had come to share a view with other fellow Andalusistas that a key symbolic and historical reference for Andalusia's social and political renewal was to be found in Al-Andalus, the historical site of the region's distinct culture and a pinnacle of its creative expression. In his own philosophical terms, Al-Andalus was, quote, the foundation of our distinct will to exist. Moreover, in the per persecution and expulsion of the Moriscos, the Iberian Muslims forced to convert to Christianity in the 16th century and then subsequently expelled early in the 17th, Infante saw an, an historical injury committed against the people of Andalusia that had remained exposed and untreated across the centuries, one on the basis of which contemporary grievances drew force and historical weight. His 1924 journey to Ahmad was undertaken for the purpose of honoring and resuscitating the memory of the celebrated Andalusian, of this celebrated Andalusian poet, and to meet with some of the des descendants of the Moors and Moriscos. Who were, who were forced into exile between the 15th and 17th centuries. Following his visit to al Muhtamid's tomb in Abamat, Infante stopped in Rabat, where he attended a gathering at which Andalusi music was performed, and where he met with descendants of those Andalusians forced into exile. Listening to the performance of Andalusi Nubas, a classical music form found primarily in North Africa, but of Andalusian origins, Infante was struck by the music's profound resonance with southern Spain's own flamenco traditions, and by the shared tragic sense at the expressive core of both musical genres. Moved by the musical intimacies binding the exiled Andalusians of Morocco with the Spanish inhabitants of their one-time home, Infante dedicated his next few years to a historical and ethnographic study of the origins and expressive repertoire of flamenco, an abridged version of which was finally published in 1980. In Flamenco, Infante could hear the sad voice of Andalusia, 
a voice that intoned simultaneously the distant suffering of Iberian Muslims forced into hiding and exile in the 17th century, and the dark travails of the contemporary Andalusian soul. Flamenco articulated a historical geography uniting Al-Andalus and Andalusia, Iberia and North Africa, a territory in Fante dedicated much of his life to surveying. In this endeavor, he was far from alone. Indeed, it is striking that almost every important contributor to the tradition of Andalusismo from the late 19th century forward has found in Flamenco a key to thinking about the unity and continuity of contemporary Spain with this medieval Muslim past. But first, a quick pause on my use of the term Andalusismo. While this term is used to designate, is often used to designate the regional nationalist movement in Spain's southernmost province, one for which Infante stands as father figure, in this paper I invoke a broader interpretation of the notion. Andalusismo, as I employ it here, refers to a modern tradition of critical reflection on the norms of Spanish as well as European politics and culture, founded upon an engagement with the histories and legacies of southern Iberia's Muslim and Jewish inhabitants. This tradition, extended, extending from the late 19th century to the present, is established on the principle that contemporary Andalusia is historically continuous with Al-Andalus, medieval Islam in Iberia, and that the challenges faced by Andalusians today require a recognition of that historical identity. <clears throat> so the larger book of which this is a part explores this tradition, this late 19th century tradition that extends to the present through four primary lenses. One is musical, another is historiographical, another political, and another uh, poetic, po poetry and, and visual arts as well. Infante made of flamenco a voice, a sound, most often a cry, of a historical subject whose experience encompassed both Muslim past and Spanish present. In doing so, he sought to transform the felt relationship between contemporary Andalusians and their distant Muslim kin, and hence the meaningful connections by which the past articulated with the present. More than establish a connection, he gave impetus to a practice of listening and reflecting on the music, musical territory expressed by this aesthetic form as central to an Andalusian ethos and perspective, a practice taken up and developed by subsequent generations of Andalusistas. During a conversation I had in Sevilla with the scholar of flamenco Cristina Cruces Bordan, she introduced a term that I find useful for thinking about sound as a historical medium. What flamenco and the Andalusi tradition share, she noted, is a common sonorous foundation, un fondo sonoro, one that makes it easy for flamenco musicians to relate to, experiment with, and understand Andalusi music. She described a conversation she had with Gerardo Nunez, a celebrated flamenco guitarist and a leader in explorations across these traditions. Gerardo put it to me this way, there, the Moroccans, Andalusi music is something universal that we, Spanish flamenco musicians, can move about in quite easily because of this shared fondo sonoro. With Andalusi musicians, when I play something, they know how to build on it, extend it. They recognize how to move within it. When I first played jazz, this is Nunez going, I could build on it because I had the technical skills, but I had no intuitive grasp of it. It was like a foreign language, though one I could learn. Andalusi music, however, is more like a language I once knew but forgot, or one I can speak without knowing. End of quote. I want to think with this notion of fondo sonoro, not just as a musical figure, but also a temporal one. The improvisational space the fondo affords to the skilled musician or listener, the connections it makes possible, is simultaneously musical and historical, an articulation of sound and of time. The tradition of Andalusismo involves a cultivated feel for the way the Iberian past and present hold together, much, of, much as a musician has a feel for the way different musical styles intersect to form a common ground, one laden with emergent musical possibility. In this encounter of horizons, the sensitive musician attempts to reveal patterns latent in the fondo, a territory of aesthetic and effective connection <coughs> capable of being articulated and heard. This territory, the sonic image of a Mediterranean world produced by the geographical imaginary of Andalusismo, will provide the Andalusistas with the effective material to shape a vision of history outside the normative political geography of, of Spain and its European career. In short, flamenco affords Andalusismo the aesthetic tools for the honing of a unique epistemic attitude, 
one attuned to the subtle yet pervasive presence of an inherited medieval world and its thematization as an important condition of contemporary social and political life. Within the sensory emotional opening afforded by Flamengo's sonic palette, Andalusistas find the possibility to, th to feel and think across the Sondo Fomero, linking Al Andalus with Andalusia, the Middle East with Europe, a form of historical reflection unsustainable within the dominant epistemological frames that constitute modern Spain as an integral part of a broader European civilization. A contemporary of Blas Infante, Rudolfo Gil Benumaya, was born in the Andalusian town of Anuja in 1901. Benumaya changed his name early in life to Torres, from Torres to Benumaya, having discovered that his mother had Morisco roots and was a descendant of Abdullah ibn Umayyad, a member of the ruling Umayyad family. He had a long career as a journalist and an administrator within the institutions of Spanish colonialism, both prior to the Civil War and later as a functionary within the Franco regime. He was an important contributor as well to the tr tradition of Andalusismo. Benumaya's political career is a study in contradiction. At the core of his thought was a radical rethinking of the contemporary geopolitical order based on a consideration of the political possibilities afforded by the concept of Hispano-Arabic civilization. The Spanish protectorate in Morocco, from 1912 to 1956, in his view, was a natural expression of the civilizational bond, a, quote, moral obligation owed to the Moroccans for reasons of history as well as race. This is one of the reasons that, for many, he's seen as a right as a uh, apologist and supporter of uh, Spanish colonial enterprise in, in Morocco. Torn apart by the early 17th century expulsion of the Moriscos and maintained in isolation over subsequent centuries by a highly <coughs> restricted and exclusionary concept of Spanish national identity, Spain and Morocco were finally, in Benoît's vision, returning to their cultural and spiritual roots through the processes of exchange and collaboration set in place by the protectorate. It is easy in this regard to, regard to, to read Benumay's views as little more than a justification for Spanish colonialism, uh, which indeed they were. And indeed, authorities in the Franco regime frequently drew on his discourse of fraternal affinity in their propaganda efforts, both in Spain and in Morocco. His views, however, also contradicted Spanish colonial logics, a contradiction expressed in Benumaya's career by the fact that he was, on one hand, an administrator within the Franco regime assigned in various parts of North Africa, and on the other, a vocal advocate for and frequent collaborator with the leaders of both the Moroccan nationalist movement and the pan-Islamist movement emerging across the Middle East in the 40s and 50s. In the perspective he developed across numerous writings, Spain no longer occupies the center of political calculus no longer organizes the terrain of political strategy. Rather, it is the Arabic-speaking world from which the possibilities of political coordination and action must be thought, a world that Spain is deeply entwined with, but which it neither dominates nor does it determine its agenda. The, the geopolitical space within which Benumaya frames his analysis of, of political action, what he denominates mediodia, like midi in France, um, emerges from the civilizational core of medieval Andalusi society, still alive within contemporary Morocco, he asserts. He calls Morocco a living museum of, uh, of Spain's own medieval past. Um, but radiating outward to embrace regions whose own political conditions structurally align with those of North Africa. Mediodia, in this sense, indicates both a civilizational concept for which al Andalus stands as a foundational moment and also a structural position in relation to contemporary distributions of power and wealth. It is also for Benumaya the political analytic through which global studies against the existing regime of European, and his concern here is primarily British and French colonialism, against European dominance can be articulated and coordinated. This, quote, universe seen from al Baisin, the old Muslim quarter in, in Granada, um, a historical weave of aesthetic, linguistic, religious, and political affiliations and affect, affects of long-buried musical harmonies and cultural correspondences offers up an antidote to the epistemological and cartographic tyrannies held in place by European power, in his view. The intelligibility of this universe requires Al-Andalus, 
a historical figure of whose temporal projection into the future <coughs> Ben Umayya and his fellow Andalusistas will repeatedly excavate from the unconsciousness of gesture, language, art, and especially music. Not surprisingly, he dedicated much of his writings to exploring both Spanish and Middle Eastern traditions of music, architecture, dance, and popular festivals, emphasizing the overlapping similarities and genealogical connections that constitute the shared cultural-spiritual reality he saw as uniting these regions. As with so many of the Andalusistas that he came to associate with in the early 1930s, including Blas Infante and the poet Federico García Lorca, Ben Umayya's Andalusista sensibilities were profoundly musical. Throughout his writings, he returned in again and again to these musical forms, tracing out each line and curve of their emotional geometries, as if the Mediterranean universe he was assembling demanded such a musical infrastructure. These lines and curves in invariably led to the South and the East, to the Arabs, Jews, and Roma, whose historical experience on Iberian soil resonated in the cry of the flamenco singer and the strum of the guitar. Ben Umayya's prose often achieved its most lyrical effects in the, in the sections on Andalusian music. I quote, Andalusian song, he writes, is the most powerful of enchantments. Its strange witchcraft is the essential note of the millinery Semitic life, elemental and indecipherable. It is the faithful expression of brown humanity, one that shifts from long periods of lethargy and indolence to the most delirious convulsions. The Mediterranean guitar and the Bedouin dulcina sing the eternal pain of the race, while a piece of spirit escapes from the throat and embeds itself in the ether of a cry that is both a prayer and a roar of a lion in heat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to say. <laughs> um, right, so one sees the sort of impact of Orientalism and of an entire fantasy of Orientalism in the sort of shaping of Andalusia. Um, so the tradition, as I explore it, right, is very entwined both with this sort of Orientalist uh, imaginary, and of course with the political realities of Spanish colonialism. Right? So um, it's entwined with those, but I, I read it in ways to suggest that it's not reducible to those, that it involves a kind of sensibilities that um, exceed those that were instrumentalized in those projects. I read Benoit's prose and the work of Andalusismo more generally as expressing an ethical ambition, an aspiration to retune the senses of his readers to a Mediterranean world fashioned of, quote, Semitic elements long denied. His writing on music often devolves into a kind of mystical poetry where his descriptive intentions are subordinated to sensory and aesthetic effects. In a section emphasizing the elements common to Andalusian musical forms and the arabesque figures that line the walls of the Alhambra in Granada, he takes the reader into a sinuous meditation on aesthetic experience. I quote, in both of these arts there is a continuous line that one only follows with difficulty until it is interrupted by the intersection of another, more subtle, that extends out and separates off and narrows in order to join with others and disappear in a great bundle. A little later the same line reappears or the same note repeats as by the same law. Notes and lines converge and come apart rapidly in a vertiginous cascade of colors that dissipate in space like the waves from stone in the water. This kind of prose, one sees it in much of Andalusista writings on flamenco. Right? It's a very, this kind of, what I call almost mystical uh, um, rhetoric. The world Ben Umayyad discovers within these musical and figural aesthetic forms, one in which elements coalesce and disperse, appear and disappear, seems to parallel the Andalusian territory that is the subject of his writing, a kind of liminal space grasped only through its fragments, through traces, ruins, gestures, tastes. Quote, it is a music that one cannot hear well, uh, but that one non nonetheless feels. Nothing concrete happens, he says, and yet it vibrates. One feels, in other words, that what defies categorization within the reigning sensory epistemology, what cannot be discerned by a national Catholic ear, a nothing, an event emptied by the inquisitional ambition to erase all traces of Islam and Judaism from language, architecture, music, custom, a non-happening that nonetheless happened and continues to vibrate, as he says, 
What the passional architecture of flamenco reveals for Ben and Maya is the hidden, quote, geopsychic territory of Mediodía, an imaginary geography that unites Spain with the Middle East and even Latin America, within the rubric of an unfolding Hispano-Arabic civilization. Andalusian song, a tradition familiar to most of his readership, provides the lens and effective grounding through which this fantastical but also possible world can be first felt, then glimpsed, and ref then reflected upon. While Ben Maya offers the arabesque as one key to this partially familiar and effective territory, it is quickly followed in his text by an exploration of various North African musical traditions bound to flamenco by family resemblance, um, among them Al Ala and Al Griha of Morocco. Let me now shift to a discussion of the sounds of Andalusism, bring this discussion to the present, by turning to one of the tradition's contemporary adherents. Antonio Manuel Rodriguez teaches law at the University of Córdoba, in addition to being a columnist and frequent contributor to a number of Cordovan journalistic media. Over the years, he participated in and was frequently a founding member of a wide range of associations, most with a progressive political agenda and a clear Andalusista tin. I mean, it's interesting that in the 30s and 40s, many Andalusistas were associated with fascism, with fascism, where today, most of them are associated with progressivist, liberal uh, tendencies. So part of the argument, right, is that Andalusism is not reducible to a particular singular kind of political uh, political stance, um, though they do share a certain way of, of posing questions about the political present by reference to this past. That's, that's what I'm, the broader book is interested in. Um, he, he is the, also the primary author of a parliamentary initiative that would enable descendants of the Moriscos to petition for Spanish citizenship. His 2010 book, the Morisco, in English, The Morisco Trace, The Al Andalus that we carry inside, has earned him a considerable following among the many Spaniards drawn to Andalusista perspectives. The political optic of Rodriguez's Andalusismo takes as its primary focus the subordination of the community to the dictates of the Spanish state and the consequent loss of freedoms, social inequality, and economic viability. The modern history of Andalusian impoverishment and marginality, and it's still the most impoverished uh, of the Spanish uh, regions, for, for Rodriguez is inseparable from a much earlier historical event, the, subjection, the subjugation of the religiously heterogeneous society of medieval Andalus to persecution and repression at the hands of the Catholic conquerors. While the forms of persecution unleashed at the time have shifted, they emerge and repeat within an abiding structure forged by the Castilian state in alliance with the church, a, a form that took the shape of national Catholicism during the Franco regime and continues today in an ongoing concordat between church and state. Andalusismo, in this sense, is a modern expression of a culture of resistance that took shape across the 16th century, in his view, in the Morisco struggle for survival against the increasing increasingly repressive apparatus of the Catholic regime. This struggle, Rodriguez asserts, it's hard to say Rodriguez repeatedly <laughs> and then into English for some reason. Uh, Rodriguez argues in the Morisco trace, did not end with the expulsion of the Moriscos in the 17th century because they were not expelled, or rather only some of them were, in his view. The, the majority, he asserts, successfully evaded expulsion vanishing into the fabric of rural, rural Andalusian society, the Inquisition having exhausted the financial and moral resources necessary to track them down. Through dissimulation and concealment, and eventually through a willful forgetting of who they were, they survived undetected. To do so, they negatively inhabited their own cultural and religious traditions, adopting the customs of their conquerors that best concealed their Muslim habits, the dress, the bathing habits, the consumption of pork, and the drinking of wine. In short, the attempts to erase Islam from the Iberian Peninsula to expunge Muslim populations, as well as the imprint they left on language, architecture, and art, and dress, failed. This fa the failure of this genocidal effort and its repression from consciousness produced a trauma within the Spanish psyche, one that continues to nourish, quote, the racist and xenophobic unreason of today, he argues. As with most other Andalusistas, flamenco will be key to Rodriguez's understanding of the culture that emerges from the wound of inquisitorial persecution. I quote, the first generations of persecuted overcome the trauma by forgetting, 
even forgetting why they must forget. Possibly this collective amnesia is accompanied by a kind of bipolar neurosis, schizoid or hysterical, that over time gives birth to the culture of flamenco. The children of their children inherit unconsciously the memory of the wound, encrypted on the instinctive and visceral creations that emerge during its cauterization. Thus we can understand the paroxysms of the dancers between sober pain and inebriated joy. End quote. For Rodriguez, following Blas Infante, Flamengo designates, quote, much more than an artistic expression. The term embraces the culture of struggle and resistance produced by the Moriscos and their descendants up to the present, a period he refers to as the, the Flamenco era. era. Andalus, quote, Andalusia became the natural catalyst for that Morisco essence, nomadic and converted, metabolized during the Flamenco era, era into a highly original culture with a humanist and universalist ideal that reached its political epiphany on the 4th of December, 1977. Here, the struggle by contemporary Andalusians against the repressive and parasitical central state, a struggle that culminated in the mass popular uprising of 1977, in which the Andalusians demanded and received the same conditions of independence as then being granted to the other autonomous regions, is continuous with the battle for survival by the Moriscos against the predations of the Catholic monarchs during the Middle Ages. Rodriguez's interpretation of the significance of flamenco for the Andalusista tradition is noteworthy. As he postulated during a meeting in his office, uh, in a meeting I had with him at the University of Cordoba, the music of flamenco, in his view, served as a repository for Andalusia's universalist culture, one particularly suited to resisting the forms of religious and secular power developed in early modern Spain. Informed by the contemporary ascension of Cartesian rationalism, the fusion of church and state that emerged in the 16th century and that would eventually reappear anew in Franco's national Catholicism, was based in a division of powers that assigned the state authority over the domain of thought and reason, with the church left a monopoly over the realms of human feeling. In, yet, in Rodriguez's view, the church's efforts to assimilate Andalusian forms within its own disciplinary purview encountered a barrier in flamenco, insomuch as the form was embedded in deeply rooted oral traditions of learning and transmission, and was sung in an Andalusian dialect rather than Spanish. As R Rodriguez noted, all attempts to dispossess a society of its stones, its documents, its religions, its people, encounters a barrier, encounter a barrier, something that cannot be so easily dispossessed. That is the heart and the throat. Sounds are not so easy to take away, nor is the heart. I read Rodriguez here to be suggesting that what he terms a flamenco society produced in the Morisco resistance to Catholic repression was to an important degree articulated sonically through the musical practices that such resistance gave shape to, and the effects that these practices orchestrated and expressed, indelibly marked by the experiences and aesthetics of Muslims, Jews, and Roma people. Flamenco contained a fundamental, a fundamental otherness that the church might tolerate as an element of popular culture, but that it could never fully appropriate or redefine. While the sources of this otherness might have been long forgotten, a condition for survival in the face of inquisitorial suspicion and threat, it would continue to anchor an effective life resistant to the project of projects of centralized power emanating from Madrid. For the time of the voice, he seems, to be, he seems to suggest, is not the time of history. The cry of the flamenco singer, as Rodriguez hears it, is a repository of sensory memory, of fragments of past experience that encompass both sides of the Mediterranean, and that when heard properly, articulate the temporality of that postulated territory of Al-Andalus, Andalusia. I read the poetics of Andalusia, its tireless celebration of flamenco's musical aesthetic, as an effort to attune the ear to this erstwhile continent of memory. Rodriguez describes the Morisco Tres as a work, his book, not, as a work not of history, not of reason, not of politics, but of passion. And this description could easily be extended to differing degrees to the entire corpus of Andalusismo. And how could it be otherwise? Through what modern reason could an Arab, Arab pain be found a home in, be discovered to inhabit a European soul? Only romantic poetry, nostalgic desire, genre is not quite fit to address the pressing issues of our time. The dominant narrative of European history in which Al-Andalus is little more than a neutral medium through which Greek knowledge arrives, unchanged in the Renaissance, 
forecloses that possibility, just as the closure of the border today aims to live in the, limit the possibilities that an Arab would inhabit a European city except as a guest worker, an immigrant, or an Arab. To think otherwise requires a break within our normative frames of reference, a break, I am arguing, that, in the views of the Andalusistas, requires a musical intervention. As the Italian thinker Giorgio Agamben has recently noted, for the ancient Greeks, music bore an intimate relation to politics. By giving expression to that which cannot be said in language, to the limits of the sayable, music demarcates the foundation upon which any word, language, or discourse will necessarily depend. Glossing the views of Plato and Aristotle, Agamben writes, in every age, humans are more or less intentionally educated to politics and prepared for it through music, even before this happens, through traditions and precepts that are transmitted by means of language. Just as for a soldier, the trumpet blast or the drumbeat is as effective as the order of the superior, or even more than it is. So in every field and before every discourse, the feelings and moods that precede action and thought are musically determined and oriented. In this sense, the state of music defines the political condition of a given society better than and prior to any other index." End quote. In Agamben's view, music at least potentially reminds us and celebrates the fact that a fundamental aspect of our lives cannot be said in language, that language is not our voice or not all of it. We might say music can affect a break between who we are and what we say, a break that is also a new foundation, call it an emotional foundation for what we can subsequently articulate linguistically. For the Andalusistas, it is in flamenco, I'm suggesting here, that such an interruption within Spanish identity can be found. The historical poetics of flamenco, elaborated by the writers of Andalusismo, such as Benumaya and Rodríguez <coughs> and Infante before them, seeks to make, seek to make the sounds of an Arabic society vibrate from within this Spanish musical form, so as to lay a, a sensory and aesthetic foundation the fondo sonoro, for the practices of historical and political reflection and critique they engage in. In their words, flamenco becomes the site for a reconfiguring of the affective and epistemic dispositions from which the virtual territory of mediodia, to use again the Nuanes term, can be charted. Forged at the juncture of Al Andalus, Andalusia, and North Africa, this fondo sonoro offers the tradition the space of improvisation within which its claims can be heard. The Andalusian who contributed most to the development of this poetic improvisation was Federico Garcia Lorca, the Granadan poet whose short life was extinguished by fascist allied forces in 1936. Lorca's most well-known encounter with Andalusian song took place at the 1922 Concorso del Cante Hondo, the Conference on Deep Song, as described as I've described elsewhere. In his presentation at this conference, and thus as a preface to the musical performances that followed at the conference, he underscored the, the, quote, gestures and lineaments of Islamic poetry that lie within the Andalusian musical tradition, reciting verses from three Muslim poets, while giving particular emphasis to the, quote, sublime ghazals of, of love of Hafiz, the 14th century Persian poet. Juxtaposing verses of Kante Ondo and those of Hafiz, Lorca tr traces the proximities of image, emotion, and theme across the two poetic repertoires, giving special attention to the shared vocabularies of love, anguish, and the presentiment of death. As if the dark, blood-soaked blood sentiments he hears in this musical form could only be glimpsed in the mirror provided by the verses of Arab and Persian poets. Across his writing, Lorca found the historical repression of Muslims, Jews, and Gypsies, Grenadans of an earlier generation in his view, suffused within the gestures and attitudes of his contemporaries, in their reserve, melancholy, in their renunciation of action, in their withdrawal into small enclosed spaces, where they, quote, hide in the interior of their houses and of their landscape, fertile ground of the aesthetics of the diminutive, the concept he used to describe Grenadan aesthetics. Lord will figure this history of persecution underlying Andalusian sadness, not as a concluded event, but as an ongoing struggle. He writes, The graves of the Catholic kings have not prevented the half-moon from rising in times within the breast of the most refined children of Granada. The battle continues, obscure and without expression. Without expression, no, for on that red hill of the city there are two palaces, both dead, the Alhambra and the palace of Charles V. 
he visited uh, the Alhambra. We're not in uh, the palace of Charles V. It's, it's right inside the Alhambra. Uh, this, that sustained the duel to the death that beats in the conscience of the Granadan of today. End quote. This trope of an ongoing battle within the Spanish psyche, founded on the conflict between Muslims and Christians, will reappear in many different guises across the 20th century across 20th century Spanish literature and historiography, as, for example, in the works of Américo Castro or the recently deceased writer Juan Goitisolo. A sensitive observer of his time and place, Lorca crafted a poetic voice through a historical anthropology of his home city, Granada, an inquiry that led him repeatedly outside the literary and conceptual confines of Europe. The Islamic world he was drawn to was not that of the luxuriant harem, the noble moor, or even the utopia of inclusion and belonging figured by the notion of convivencia. Rather, to decipher the palimpsest of Granada required knowledge of the Islamic traditions that had long before left their indelible marks on the cityscape. <coughs> Granada spoke to Lorca in a voice composed of multiple strands from across the Mediterranean, a voice he sought to capture not through imitation, but via a creative elaboration that would do justice to the past, present, and future of the life world he valued. This voice achieved its purest form, not in human speech, but in the inarticulate, almost animal cry of anguish he discerned at the heart of Andalusian Cantalón, or Flamenco. An anguish Lorca designated as pena negra, or the black dread. Quote, a pain from which one can escape only by using a knife to open a deep wound in the left side. Uh, it is a longing without object, a pronounced love for nothing, with the certainty that death, the endless concern of Andalusia is breathing on the other side of the door. While readers of Lorca have celebrated his poetic elaboration of the theme of Andalusian sadness and pain, La Pena Negra, his, his connection with that experiential condition uh, to the Moors, his connection of that experiential condition to the, to the Moors and their demise is widely viewed as a flight from history into Orientalist fantasy. Something is lost in this view, however. As I see it, Lorca's attunement to the Arabic voice within the flamenco singer's cry takes the form not of a myth, but of a po poetic practice that constitutes one of the most productive literary encounters across the Mediterranean of the 20th century, one that discloses a historical and aesthetic space not easily explored within the normative discourses of civilizational identity that surrounded him. What is clear is that for many Andalusians, music, and flamenco in particular, becomes a thread that binds them on one hand to the medieval Muslim past, and on the other across the straits to Morocco, North Africa, and on further to the east. The complex and often indecipherable network of relations across the music of these times and places articulates a sonic territory, a fondo sonoro, one that musicians from the mid-20th century forward would increasingly set out to explore. These journeys have resulted in a wide spectrum of musical collaborations, bringing together Spanish flamenco artists, specialists in medieval European music, Moroccan performers of Andalusi music, as well as musicians specializing in other Arab genres, Arabic genres. Exploiting the possibilities of musical connection, affordances, uh, affordances of sound and style grounded in affinities both historical and acoustic, these collaborative ventures have produced a, a rich variety of musical melanges, blendings of diverse yet related traditions that, in the view of some observers, exemplify the heterogeneous and inherently open object that flamenco has always been, and that Al-Andalus has sometime, sometimes stood to symbolize. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Charles, for a wonderful presentation. Um, Thank you. As you can imagine, I have numerous questions. But we'll open it to the floor to start with to see questions around the pads. Please. I actually have a question to something very specific that you mentioned. Uh, Norka talking about the wound on the left side. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you know why he chose left and not right, and if that connects to this whole Story. That's a great question. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. No one has asked me that, and that's a very interesting mm -hmm. question. Do you, do you have a sense? Well, in Judaism, the yeah. left is a side of discipline, and the side, in, in Kabbalah, uh -huh. and that 
that region. I mean, I don't know how much he would have known, yeah. that, but that's always um, very much a, a thing. You talk about the left, and the left is the side of reception also. Discipline in terms of being disciplined, or in terms of self-discipline? It's kind of a mystical concept of um, there's, there's expansiveness and containment. Uh -huh. And so the left is a side that, that creates structure, that creates mm -hmm. containment. Um, that's not the, the limitless expansion, but that actually allows for boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting. The one would be on the side of containment. I know. That's Love why them. I've heard that and I thought, oh, that I'm just interested in knowing. Yeah, that's fascinating. I should, I should look into this. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Sure. Maybe more by way of clarification. You set up kind of halfway through this distinction between music and voice, or music and language, sorry. Um, and then we arrive to poetry, kind of toward the end of Garcia Lorca. Is poetry a kind of synthesis of those two in this model, or is it um, something that sort of moves back and forth? Is it neither? How do you kind of position those three things? I don't really think of it as a synthesis. Um, in some sense, what interested me is that <coughs> Lorca took as he took this tradition of Canteondo as very important for his own sort of poetic explorations. So the connection is there for me in, in Lorca's own biography and his own sort of style of, of exploration. So I'm not really making a claim that it's kind of intermediate, <coughs> though, of course, in some ways we could say, right, it is, it invokes it employs elements that foreground uh, aspects of language that pull away from content and that are not as, not so much about reference. And so in that sense, it has kind of musical qualities. But I haven't really, it's not really because of that intermediate. It's more of what um, engagement happened to sort of emphasize this whole thing. It was very much uh, really uh, both a, a student of and enthusiast of Andalusian musical traditions. And in his writings, including his, his uh, biographical writing, and even in his poetry <coughs> itself, references very frequent to that. And that's what drew me, drew me to it. Thank you for your talk, uh, so much. Um, as somebody who doesn't know great about um, theme music, but um, so I'm more familiar with. Of father and mm -hmm. on the idea of an incident that we yeah. come along. I wonder if there's some parallels of control, especially with regard to Loki and Penanegra and sort of Salvade, mm -hmm. but also just um, how there might be other kind of connections in terms of how the relationship between music and the history, um, both the political ambiguity and sort of political appropriation, complicity, um, histories of sanitization modification, states also tourism even, you know, um, seems to be quite a lot of parallels between some of what's happening there, even what gets called sort of self-orientalizing mm -hmm. politics of place, um, all that, uh, if there's anything you <laughs> out that might help clarify actually the Spanish uh, situation for me. That's a lot, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things to say. So, um, I mean, in terms of like heritage and tourism, it sounds certainly a key aspect of the contemporary history of this tradition has been the way in which you know, it's found uh, renewed impetus in, in its incorporation into the heritage industry, which has certainly made, given it audiences for its own, you know, uh, so much of, you know, if you go to Granada today, right, right there are many sort of Andalusis organizations Many of them are like involved in exploring relations between North Africa and, and uh, Spain historically and in the present. Um, many are involved in kind of trying to recuperate classical Andalusian aesthetic and musical forms. But they're, in, they're, they're dependent on and derive funds from and are supported by the state, which is aimed at holding up heritage as central to the economy of all of Spain, in particular. <coughs> so, it's, that's certainly, it's interwoven with those practices. Though again, I want, you know, my own approach emphasizes the way that uh, 
it would be wrong to simply see those as purely artifacts of, you know, driven by economic imperatives. It's certainly they're sustained by and modified and shaped by um, those economic uh, imperatives, but but I think the tradition itself is not simply one that is a product any more than it's a product of fascism because it was useful for in a certain moment for the Franco regime in justifying its own colonial policies. In terms of complicity and so on, I think that um, I mean, it's interesting, this sort of moment from the late 19th century, there's a range of kind of thinking in Spain and elsewhere that we tend to read through the lens of fascism because, you know, when we think about romantic development of kinds of romantic thought, it's, it's nightmare terminus is in fascism, right? And, that, and hence, we tend to sort of think about these various encounters with romanticism as, as you know, the opening up a danger that was realized subsequently. But many of these, you know, the, the thinkers I'm looking at, I think that it's not, they're not just sort of, a, the kind of thought they're developing in itself is not intrinsically fasc fascistic. It doesn't necessarily culminate in fascism, even though it's clear that fascism is one of the possible outcomes, or one of the, and I think like Ben Umayya, I think he was fascinated, as were many there, with the idea of the sort of, the new man, right, which was kind of a fascist uh, idea, that you could, through the intervention of the state, transform people in this, you know, bring about this radical transformation and production of a new society. He was entirely sort of seduced with the, these capacities that seemed possible, and that even though his own kind of political writing and his own political career, and not to mention his kind of essayistic writing, were never kind of, um, I mean, a lot of it, he was also arrested by the Franco regime for, for collaborating with the Moroccan nationalists. He was also very much like strategizing with pan Islamists and became, you know, very much a collaborator, both in writing and, and his, own, his own sort of activities. Right? He was not just like a supporter from afar, but was trying to build you know, economic institutions that would support these kind of emerging tendencies within the Middle East. Um, so he has this very ambivalent relationship to fascism. He's sort of attracted to the capacities it makes possible and thinks that this may be. But he has this vision of the world and he sees Latin America is also key because it's also, <coughs> Latin America is part of this kind of a world whose core is Andalus, Andalus that spreads and with the spread of sort of, you know, Hispanic civilization or what he calls Hispano Arabic civilization. So he sees that key to Latin America is the privileged role of Arabs in all of these countries in Latin America. And he establishes ties with Arab leaders throughout uh, different countries in Latin America and seeks to build this sort of network that will be the basis of a kind of new kind of global order that he envisions. It is really not, you know, in ways it was to be the advantage, it was always cast that it would also be to the advantage of Spain. But in many ways, uh, it, it would also uh, threaten them to, it wasn't always to Spain's advantage, at least, and the regimes in power saw him as a threat at times, even though they never you know, fully uh, repressed his writing. So he, he complained bitterly about the way his writings were taken up and used as a justification for colonialism, even though he never quite left the colonial enterprise and always thought there was some utility he you know, could have within it. So these very ambivalent lives. And, um, So I, you know, in some sense, as I said, I think there's a tendency in, in Spain today, this kind of history, for many, is, is felt as a certain danger because it opens up the, day, uh, the possibility, because it emphasizes a kind of deep abiding sense of Spanish history rooted in this past. That sounds like fascism, because the idea of a deep history, right? And that, even though it's, you know, used by progressives today, it still seemed to have this kind of attachment to romanticism and the idea of these kind of essential historical depths that define who we are. That to contemporary secular uh, intellectuals sounds like a threat, and hence the kind of why the reception of these uh, these kind of ideas are people are highly skeptical. And, 
Now that didn't answer everything. But, I mean, everything would do. Given the answer to everything. Oh, sorry, did you go? No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I have kind of a technical question. Please. But I, I love the quote by Agamben. As someone from a refugee studies background, you know, we talk a lot about Agamben's theory of fair life and the effects of camps on kind of human social order. Yeah. So I was just kind of wondering uh, where did that, what, which text is that? It just from? came out about a year okay. ago. Okay. It's a new book. It's called, I think it's called What is Philosophy? What is Philosophy? And there's an essay on music. Okay, fantastic. Charles, if I may. This is really exciting yeah. work, so it intersects so much many things I'm interested in. Um, you touched towards the end of your paper about the some of the, the collaborative projects that are going on, yeah. and particularly Spanish and working positions. Yeah. And so this is where my research is trying to focus on at the moment. I just wanted to get your sort of take on some of your experiences in, in Granada, perhaps, and some yeah. of the projects that you may have looked at. I appreciate you coming more from a historical perspective. Um, I found uh, Christina Clouset Roldan's notion of um, the sonorous foundation mm -hmm. from some novel particularly interesting, and there's lots of ways in, ways in which this gets characterised by musicians you know, in terms of a, you know a, a, a musical brotherhood that there are two musical traditions yeah. born of the same root, the sons of Zirab and so on and so forth. There's numerous yes. other ways in which flamenco and Arab and sea music is sort of brought together, and of course Christina. Um, you've probably come across a book from Megan that we see other mentors um, in Quinto. Yeah. Um, so argument from Megan who see music arguments for a musical encounter, um, and she sort of traces some of those possible linkages. That's right. Um, but very often when musicians come to bring them together, the sort of rhetoric there is one of you know musical affinity if they both come from the same root. But actually the reality of bringing them together is a very different thing because if, yeah. really they are completely disjunct traditions in many respects. You know, they come from very different sort of social spaces. Arab and music is often associated with a sort of middle class elite tradition in, in, in Morocco. Yeah. And Flamenco doesn't have that sort of trajectory. So they come from, they occupy different social spaces. Um, so there's that sort of issue, and I wonder whether that comes through in your, in any of the work that you've done, how musicians bring these together. The Certainly comments by musicians make that yeah. point. They yeah. often point out, and Moroccan musicians particularly, I know, yeah. they've emphasized to me that these are fundamentally different in song, even though they themselves, of course, are engaged in musical practices that combine, right? But they are, while emphasizing the difference. So you're right, it is difficult, <coughs> but it's interesting to think like, That doesn't mean there aren't uh, you know, affinities. Of course, absolutely. Uh, yeah. right. Certainly, there's all kinds of we've seen yeah. a lot of collaborations which explore this kind of, and there's a great industry that's emerged around. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, but it's just interesting that's the tension, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Between the, the discourse around yes. it that connects them, um, yes. and the actual difficulties on right. sometimes in putting together these projects, yes. and some of the criticism that comes from sort of you know from many Orthodox American musicians is that it's very courtly and you know, it's very cut and paste. I don't know, fit together very well, these sorts of fusions. So it's quite interesting that, yes. that tension going on there. And then that kind of maps on to another related question in the broader sort of social context of, of, of Moroccan immigration. And you've yes. probably come across Daniela Flesler and the book yes, yes. Return of the Moor. Yes. Yeah? Um, and the, you know, the arrival of, of Moroccan immigration from late 80s, 90s in yeah. you know, significant numbers has created a kind of um, an issue in how Spanish history, in this particular history, is being read, yeah. um, and the extent to which Moroccans are sort of being folded into that narrative or are being rejected, and there's a sort of certain degree of cultural anxiety here from the Spanish side around how Moroccans in particular should be sort of integrated into their own view of, of Spanish history. Um, so it's interesting when Moroccans start to come in and, and perform with Spaniards and how they interact with flamenco. And there's, I don't know if you know the work of Brian Carl. Um, he wrote uh, an article across the divide where he touches on some of these sort of collaborative projects and one of the sort of most prominent things that he took back from his field work was that Moroccans need flamenco not the other way around I understand you certainly are around the sea music but flamenco is sort of a form of cultural capital um, in order for them to gain sort of space within Andalusian society and often um, you know a number of scholars have looked at the ways in which Moroccans will uh, or Moroccans are sort of a space is found for Moroccans within the Andalusian region, which is quite interesting. We were talking about um, 
the uh, the De La Toma yeah. celebrations. So I just sorry that was a complete ramble. There's not really a question there, um, but I just wondered whether you sort of reflected on on that those sorts of issues and. Yeah, that last point you make that made sense to me, mm. um, and certainly, I think you know these, these sort of fusions have provided an avenue for many Moroccans to mm. sort of find a, a place within Spain, mm. right? And otherwise, or in Morocco, for that matter, right? Oh, Morocco, and, yeah. um, <coughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think you know Daniela's. Uh, well, right, she emphasizes this sort of ambivalent. On one hand, um, on one hand, Spain is once again sort of called on to sort of police the boundary of Europe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so she's exploring these, these different tensions, but once again, sort of it now can can emphasize its own value to Europe precisely by being the one that ensures once again, just as they did in the six, in the sixteenth century, right? Once again they're the one who keep the Moors out that define the boundaries sure. of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think these questions like this notion of Fondo Sonoro, I I gave a, a version of this talk in Berkeley a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Someone asked um, this question said, well, the, well the, this term just sounds like a kind of uh, a romantic folk term, and then I use it uncritically and so on, because isn't it a sort of simply a romantic notion? Mm -hmm. And I, we didn't get the chance to talk about that, but it seems like relevant here. Um, right, because I mean, a lot of this, the whole question of a lot of this work is has to do with how much it overindulges in the, sort of the same romanticism that it's, that it's tracking. Right, that this is certainly a part of a kind of romantic movement that's very much influenced by romanticism. And so like I took the comment of this uh, interlocutor to suggest, right, that in some ways that the concept was its analytical value was suspect because of the way in which actually you know, I take the that claim must mean something like that. Um, it strays from sort of its its commitment to objectivity is suspect, or something like this, right? That in some ways, it um, right its romantic element is that it you know it it posits this sort of area of fusion where historically there isn't, right? And and as you mentioned, that musically there are tensions between these musics and so on, and historical differences. So this is, so the question comes down to this one of sort of well. Like these arguments I cite, a lot of them straight historians would not take these arguments, right? I mean, the arguments by Rodriguez about how flamenco provided a kind of repository for <coughs> memory, this would all be taken as, you know, metaphysics and mysticism by most historians, let's say. Um, and my sense is, like, I, I think that what Andalusismo is not that, in that sense, uh, Rigorously historiographic in the way that, right, yeah. as, as as would be considered by contemporary historians. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's not. I think that you know the discipline of history tends to neglect that it itself is grounded in certain sensibilities about the way the present articulates with the past, and that is not something that's simply objective in a simple sense, but depends on how one kinds of questions and how. How the president or orients one, and what kinds of things are highlighted such that they stand out as relevant to an account today. All of that presupposes certain kinds of sensibilities. But I'm arguing here that right that these musical sensibilities, in some sense, became a key arena in which this enterprise of trying to connect these histories were made. Right of trying to bring out the relevance of certain aspects of the past in the present. The music provided a kind of a place for the cultivation of sensibilities that allowed one to sort of see and experience those connections. Mm -hmm. Were they pure? Does that mean that they were created out of nothing? No, I don't think they were created out of nothing. Those histories, even though very, even in the highly speculative sort of ones, they're not, they're not exactly right from a historical standpoint. You know, if we cited historians, um, but nor are they. They're not. They're not quite historical discourses anyway, though. I mean, that it's be wrong to simply read them as purely as observations made from within the discipline of history. 
their attempts to grasp aspects sort of what is what are significant possible relations here, and and to think that well the discipline of history does not monopolize the possibilities by which the past may be made uh, relevant in the present, and that music becomes one of the sort of ways to, to actually through which his, historical connections come to be articulated. I think. Uh, there was one other comment I was going to make. Um, no, I'll, I'll stop there. So, I didn't answer everything you said, but it I think like, these the questions about the tensions between music is interesting. And like, you're right, she makes it sound like there's this, this effortless kind of fusion. But it's not so effort, it's not effortless. But on the other hand, people, a, lot of, a lot of people I know in Spain say, oh yeah, these new fusions are ugly, right? They're like, oh, they're, these things don't really fit together and so on. That, I take it, is a judgment that is, <coughs> um, right, there's more behind that judgment than some Absolutely. sort of, yeah, yeah. some sort of A's, you know, sort of objective uh, aesthetic analysis of these forms. Um, so, are there any other questions? I did, yep, go on then, I did have one more, I can always ask one. <laughs> I'm not sure if my question leads to anything, but um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more in what precise way you use the words Andalusian, Spanish, and so on. Are those ethnonyms? Do they refer to linguistic communities? Do they refer to racial communities? Um, uh, do they refer to political units? Um, <clears throat> and maybe this also has to be differentiated in a historical perspective. And then maybe related to that is um, when musical relations are articulated, what is the ling language that is used to make sense of musical relations from different communities? Is this a racial um, vocabulary, for instance, that is used, or is it vocabulary that comes from political relations or has maybe nothing to do with anything. Maybe music provides some vocabulary to um, come to terms with um, relations between communities that are neither political nor racial or anything. I mean, like Ben my I always look at that, I was writing in the <coughs> teens and twenties and thirties and so. Um, so he, you know, very much a man of his times, he thought of Hispano-Arabic civilization in, in through a kind of a, you know, a, a language of race, you know, of the Semitic races and the brown races, and he very much had a kind of racial discourse at the time. And uh, also through these sort of uh, geographical determinism, you know, and this, these ideas of sort of shared climate. And, yeah. So a whole set of whether what were sort of then contemporary discourses on on geography and history, these climatological and racial and particularly civilization, right? The concept of civilization was central, and so he articulated that <coughs> through that lens, and and so in, in in you know his his writing about music is that certainly shaped. Um, the way in which he understood these connections were expressions of a kind of soul that was forged of a shared racial and historical inheritance, civilizational inheritance. And al Andalus is like the, the core and then it spreads out into all the way to India and all the way to, to uh, uh, the, the New World. Um, and he saw those places aligned in that moment because they were all they all stood in a similar relation to European power as well. He saw them as the sort of sites of a kind of shared anti-colonial, and their, their unity was to be thought in Andalus, and, and that gave Spain a very privileged position in the world. Right? Spain could be the center where the global anti-colonial revolution mm -hmm. could be undertaken, and that could be the key to Spanish power once again. Um, so now, you know, these, the way contemporary thinkers like Rodriguez, who I mentioned, it, it's, it's largely devoid of the kind of racial language, but it is, it's still a language of, you know, I would say, a culture, and a language of 
um, right, he's, he's the way in which he talks about these sort of <coughs> these deep uh, inheritances that remain relatively unchanged over long uh, centuries and are that are grounded in right in in these kind of folk practices that um, are somewhat immune to the changing times, right? And that therefore go back to this moment where Al Andalus was, a, you know, was this sort of intersectional space. So there, there's a there's a kind of language of, you know, it's a language of a kind of you go quickly to sort of, you know, a, a kind of soul emerges in you know, like what is this deep seated essential features of culture that have this kind of longevity and grounded in memory and so on. So that's close to the language he uses, something um, more anthropological, but it's still dependent on perhaps these older notions of civilization in ways, deracialized in some ways, it doesn't invoke Semitic race. But in terms of Andalusia, like these terms, Andalusia is on one hand, as I use it here, um, and the sort of contemporary Andalusistas use it, they're referring to the state of the state of Andalusia, right? As, as one of the regions, one of the autonomous, called an autonomous community of in Spain. Um, and particularly because there was from the Las Infantes, as I mentioned, the founder of this movement. So there is an independence movement that starts in the in the twenties, in which this you know this region becomes is both increasingly demands political autonomy and eventually in nineteen seventy seven is afforded a degree and, and now has more degree of, of political autonomy. Um, and the term Al Andalus is a more uh, contested one, right? Because for some historians Al Andalus they use it sort of. Uh, Al Andalus seems to suggest for some kind of unity when where there was perhaps not such a unity of right? if Al Andalus is used as a kind of blanket term to describe you know the sort of space of Muslim rule in you know, from the eighth century, or, then historians will object that well, like these things were both fragmented and they were, you know they could not be defined purely in terms of kind of rule here, even though some, often that rule involved was much more porous and so, and the al Andalus therefore is a kind of romantic term itself, right, because it postulates this kind of shared territory where there is no such shared thing. Um, for these Andalusistas, though, as I mentioned, there's a way, they're, they're all trying to sort of bridge this divide between al Andalus and contemporary Andalusia, and, and, this, and, and that the thing will wait. There is a continuity here, and it's been hidden by systematic repression of its of that inheritance, and it's their task to sort of show the way in which um, in, in which uh, one can find and discover in one's own gestures, in one's own language, that that prior history. Um, and not surprising, I mean, within sort of uh, for mainstream historians, you know, in, against that, there's really a kind of there's a kind of uh, argument about you know the importance of the, the principle of sort of uh, change and historical change negates the possibility of any such continuity. So there's a kind of presentism that is like very strong within Spanish historiography about kind of ontology of constant flux, such that the present always escapes the past and does not bring it forward. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's... So did you... Um, I was just following up on that. I, yeah. I suspect musicologists would say the same thing, that music itself yeah. struggles to bear the weight of, of everything that's put here. And I, I really like the way you put it a minute ago, that music becomes a site for kind of cultivating sensibilities about these ideas, but it seems like it's almost actually a kind of um, like a discursive history or like a history of, of how these ideas were being told about in these times rather than actually anything that music is doing. Is that a fair restatement or is that also still kind of the same 
I mean, I mean, um, I wouldn't want to go that far in simply saying it, because then you're sort of simply privileging discourse as that which is, right, which, that which kind of, uh, you know, which simply determines the, you know, what is available to us, as if, therefore, all, all our engagement with history is simply the way we produce it in discourse today, and there is no other history, <laughs> for example. If there is another history, then what form does it, if history isn't just invented by those who define what it is, right, if history isn't just uh, simply a product of contemporary ideological discourses, then we have to think about, well, how does aspects of the past bear on the present in ways that are irreducible to the discourses by which we narrate them? Clearly, the discourses we use to narrate them has a big impact on, you know, on the way the sort of instrumental uses of history today. But uh, I think that one has to think about there are aspects of history that, resist, that are simply not graspable through the idea of instrumentality, that we simply, we make history whatever we want. Right, if we could, then if history was that malleable, if it didn't sort of actually limit what we could do with it in ways. And it's sort of, I think this idea that therefore history is also is a friction on human design, not just a sort of, not just a malleable discourse by which we, you know, put to ideological use as needed. So, it's, so that's why I'm sort of, but you're right, once we start talking about sounds, like, okay, well, aren't we just implying like, isn't the meaning of these sounds or calling them, you know, sort of invoking this sort of, don't they bear this memory? Isn't that a construction of the very, the discourses that identify them as such, right? Which is what you're suggesting, right? And so in what ways can we think of, I mean, you know, I suppose anthropologists would say there are kind of, one thinks about folk traditions of, right, folk traditions of learning and how certain kinds of, therefore, even recuperations of certain kinds of memory um, uh, that, uh, that are grounded in the way that, despite that world of constant flux, there are also uh, kinds of practices of training and of including vocal training and so on that, that are also, um, you know, that are simply not reducible, that, that in that install kind of capacities that are not reducible to the discourse that defines them, right? That, that says, oh, that's what that means, right? But that are actually kind of aptitudes rooted in, you know, like rooted in skills of the body in ways. And I think that that would be the argument, and I would, um, and the other thing, like, about the actual, like, the way in which these connections are postulated between this sort of between uh, musics in, let's say, North Africa and Spain today. Most musicologists, I think, will say, well, that's overstated, right? That, well, yeah, you know, certainly there's, yeah, maybe there is that, but there's even other connections, perhaps, that are even more important, or, for the Andalusistas, though, that's not the point. The point is this connection, and to the extent that it exists, that's the one that matters. Whether from a sort of a, a balanced historical perspective, one would say, well, wait a minute, the influence of this other French tradition has even been even greater. The other Lucistas would probably say, well, that misses the point. The point being, you know, this is not some democracy of history. This is in which, you know, the, this is a space in which this is significant. When, and one when hears this quite significant relation, However well, minor one might, from a historical, right, historiographic point of view, it would appear something like that is what I would say. Can you say on that note? Thank you once again, Charles. Thank you. Nice.